We're not proving the Bible. The Bible was the authority that we started with. The Bible tells us about the flood. We take what the Bible says, and now as real scientists doing real research, we collected real samples, we did real analyses. You've seen the evidence, and we can therefore dogmatically assert that the evidence in God's world confirms what we read in God's word. Hi, I'm Dr. Andrew Snelling. As you can tell, I don't talk like an American because I'm Australian born and raised. Uh, I did my PhD in geology at the University of Sydney, Australia, and I've been involved in creation ministry now for over 40 years. And currently I'm the director of research at Answers in Genesis and obviously a research geologist. And so, you know, I often laughed and told people I'm a rock doctor, but don't come to me with your medical problems. Now, we've been talking about uh, the Grand Canyon. And why do we talk about the Grand Canyon? Is because it is usually exhibit A for millions of years of slow and gradual evolutionary geological processes. And so as flood geologists and biblical creationists, we want to reclaim the Grand Canyon as exhibit A for recent creation and a global flood cataclysm. And so this is what this research is about. I've devoted a lot of my time through trips through in trips through the canyon to study the rock layers in the Grand Canyon and various features about the canyon to demonstrate that the layers in the Grand Canyon, the horizontal, flat-lying, fossil-filled layers of sandstone, mudstone, limestone, okay, sandstone as sand turned to stone, etc. Uh, these were formed in the year of the flood. And in the project that we're highlighting here, uh, it's about where the layers, these layers were folded or bent uh, when the plateau through which the canyon was carved subsequently were bent. And we set up a, a problem here that, that was designed to be solved by this research project. Um, the conventional wisdom is that these layers were deposited up to 14,000 feet of layers, not just in the Grand Canyon, but to the north, uh, up in through uh, Zion Canyon and Bryce Canyon. These layers were formed over 450 million years. And then 50 million years ago, uh, these layers were pushed up when the plateau was uplifted slowly and gradually over millions of years, and these layers were bent. And so in that scenario, the earliest layers, which we're examining in this research project, the Tapit Sandstone, the Bright Angel Shale, and the Muav Limestone, these were supposedly deposited 500 million years ago, and then uh, they were bent 450 million years ago, supposedly, when the plateau was pushed up. After that 450 million years, with all these other layers stacked on top of them, pressing down on them with heat and pressure, uh, the layers were bent after they were dried out, after they were hardened. And therefore, uh, why would we see that in the, the folds, as I'll show you photographs in a moment, these folds are bent smoothly without the fracturing you'd expect from a brittle rock layer. You know, concrete is a man-made rock. If you try to bend it, it shatters, okay? And they say, well, wait a minute. With the heat and pressure, the rock would have been made plastic and be able to bend slowly. Well, if that was the case, we'd expect to find the heat and pressure affected the, the grains in the rock. The cement would have been made pliable and it would have changed. And so there ought to be changes in the rock that you should be able to see under the microscope, which is why I have a microscope here, which we'll come to in a moment. And so that was that's their scenario, you know, hundreds of millions of years of deposition, then hardening, and then bending. Whereas from a biblical worldview perspective, you know, God's given us the history of the earth with creation about six or so thousand years ago, the flood, about in 4,350 4, 4, uh, years ago, 4,350 uh, years ago. And uh, in that flood year, one year, all the layers were deposited, not over hundreds of millions of years, 
At the end of the flood, when the plateau was pushed up, the Bible talks about the valleys sinking, the mountains rising at the end of the flood, Psalm 104. Uh, then these layers were then bent while they were still wet and soft, uh, which would be understandable because uh, that's what we see. They're bent smoothly. And then they dried out and hardened. Okay. And so we have a, here a stark contrast, a stark contrast. Was it hundreds of millions of years, deposition, hardening, and then bending? Or was it the flood year recently, deposition, bent while still soft and wet, and then hardened? And we should be able to see the differences in these uh, rock layers as a consequence. Okay, three rock layers four different folds. And we had to apply for an application, uh, apply for with a proposal to collect the samples in the park, which is fair enough. And we were denied. So we fought a lawsuit. And so this, and we won the lawsuit. So that became a very public, public, uh, this has become a very public research project because the details of the lawsuit victory appeared in all the newspapers, uh, even in Australia. And so uh, when we got to go into the canyon in August 2017 to collect the samples, that's right, it takes a long time to do research. We're now 2024 and this research project is just at the point of being wrapped up. Um, the pr approach was to collect samples from these, the three rock layers in the four folds and to systematically collect where the layers were still flat and then through the bend, the bends of these folds, and then also to collect samples from a distance away from the same three rock layers. Why? Because we wanted to contrast. Now, if the samples were all the same, okay, uh, if there was no difference from the layers, uh, the same layers away from the folds and in the folds, then that means that the all the layers were in the same condition when they were bent. And we would say that it was soft and wet. Whereas if it was over millions of years and the rocks had already hardened when they were bent, we would expect that the stresses on the rock in the bends would, would make the character of the rock different to the limbs of the folds and especially to the samples miles away from the folds in the same rock layers. And so here was a an approach that would try to answer this question, which view is correct based on the conditions of these rocks? So that, that gets us up to where we are at the beginning of this seg session and helps you if you didn't get to see our last presentation. Uh, but I encourage you to go back and see that because you get a lot of interesting more details and explanations. But let's move forward now. We went on this research trip and what did we do? Well, here's the fault. Here's one of these faults. Here's the Carbon Canyon fault. This is the bending of this uh, sandstone, the Tapit sandstone. This was our first target for sampling. And again, for those of you who didn't, haven't seen this photograph before, you can see that the layers of the sandstone to the left there are flat lying. And then you go over to where that man is for scale, and you can see just where he is, the layers are bent smoothly through uh through 90 degrees and uh you can see if we zoom in closer here's these bends and you can see uh what how we sampled them we chose we chose a particular bed okay one one sub layer within the whole sandstone and we systematically collected you can see those those yellow stars okay and you can see how they follow. You can see the men there for scale. You can see we got samples where the, the sandstone is flat lying and where you can see the bends. And that wasn't the only location. We went into this bend here. And you can see I collected, we collected samples uh, in the bend, one sample there in the bend with a yellow star and samples either side. Okay, so the idea is to uh, contrast samples in the bends with samples away from the bends. Okay. Uh, here's the monument fold. 
the monument fold. I said there were four folds we sampled, and this is also in the Tapete sample, uh, Tapete sandstone, I should say. This is downriver further into the plateau because the plateau got wrinkled like carpet gets wrinkled if you push it together. So there are other folds within the plateau, not just at the edge of the plateau. And what did we do here? Well, it was very hard because of the scale of these folds, but we sh chose a bed there on the left uh, with a bend in it and another bend, another part of the bend uh, on the right there, these two layers, because you can see all the debris in the foreground is burying uh, the continuity of some of those layers. And to get the same layer on the left as on the right, you can see how high we'd have to climb up that cliff at, at several hundred feet. And so uh, this is a, a diagram of our sample locations on those two marked areas. So you can see we, we've got a whole suite of samples we collected from the limbs and in the bends. And uh, there's the, in real life, you can see the, the uh, bed that we chose and the four of those samples marked by those four stars. You can see the ladder there. Yes, we took a 14 foot extension ladder to get up high. You can see the, the person there for scale. So these are, these are quite significant uh, bends and folds in the, in the canyon. Then further downstream in the Muave limestone, there's the Mat Katamiba fold. And you can see here, uh, there's me for scale in the blue. Uh, I'm not an ant, but you can see me there. And this is a significant bend in the rock. Uh, you can see that black line about where my head is. And you can see the dashed line is the boundary between two parts of the Muave limestone. We call them two members. Uh, and you can see... We, I collect, we collected samples on either side of those of that contact zone, that boundary zone. Uh, you can see them out there on the limb to the right and then progressively up through the bend. Okay, that's the strategy. Here's the Whitmore helipad fold, the Whitmore helipad fold. Uh, that's the place where we often get on helicopters to get a helicopter to get out of the canyon. Again, there's the extension ladder because it's up on a cliff. And this is in the Bright Angel Shale and Siltstone. There's both rock units, both rock types in this in this fold, the Whitmore Helipad fold. And you can see there's a, a group of samples. Some are from the bends in the fold. There's two bends and some are from away from the bends, okay, to contrast what was going on. Let's examine what it was like with the minerals and the textures because, after all, if the heat and pressure that made, supposedly made the rock plastic over millions of years uh, so that the rocks then bent smoothly, that heat and pressure would have metamorphosed or changed the rock just like a caterpillar metamorph metamorphoses into a caterp into, caterpillar metamorphoses into a butterfly. So there's the overview map of the canyon where I've got the Carbon Canyon fold and the monument fold, but this is the Tapete sandstone. We also wanted to collect samples miles away from these folds. And so you can see from the brown stars where we collected these regional samples, okay? Miles away from these folds. Uh, here it is on the satellite view that uh, we've seen before in the previous session. The green area is the vegetation on the higher elevation Kaibab, uh, Kaibab Plateau. Uh, you can see the edge, the eastern edge of that, that plateau is where the bending occurred in which the Carbon Canyon Fold is found. You can see the red arrow there labelled Carbon Canyon Fold. And you can see the yellow star there just to the north of the Little Colorado River where we collected a, a regional sample. And then we collected a regional sample near the Monument Fold and then further downstream from the monument fold. To get a contrast, here's the sample site for that regional, first of the regional sample sites in the Tapete sandstone. So we went in there on this raft trip and collected these samples. Here's the second regional sample, just to show you what this sandstone looks like in outcrop. Okay, so back to our research approach. If the if the folding or the bending had occurred when these rock layers were already hard, okay, they'd already been cemented, 
In other words, sand had turned into sandstone, mud had turned into mudstone, lime had turned into limestone, okay? If the rocks were already hard and cemented, just like the concrete after delivery in the concrete truck has dried out to be rock hard, okay? Then the samples from the folds, especially from the bend zones, which call the hing zones, should be noticeably, noticeably different from equivalent samples collected distantly from the folds, that is, uh, from the limbs and from the regional areas. Okay, there should be a difference because, after all, the, the hardened rock would have been under so much extra stress in that bend. The grains would have moved relative to one another. The cent cement would have been distorted. And we should be able to see those differences under the microscope, which is why I've got the microscope here to talk about the technology that we use. On the other hand, okay, if the folding had occurred when the rocks were still soft and wet, okay, and that's our biblical perspective because they were deposited during the flood and then only months later they were bent so they would still be soft and wet. They hadn't yet hard, dried out and hardened and so it would have been it would have been deposition, bending, and then and then hardening, whereas the millions of years approach, gradual approach, says it was it was deposition over millions of years, then hardening over millions of years, and then hundreds of millions of years later bending. Okay, a marked contrast in time scale and sequence. Okay, if if it was Deposition, then bending very soon afterwards when the layers were still soft and wet, then all the samples should essentially be the same because then they would have all dried out. They would have all been bent. They would have been bent when they were soft and wet and the layers away from the folds would still be soft and wet and then they all hardened and so everything would be equivalent between the distant samples and the samples from the bends in the folds. And so that's what was set up in this research project. Now, the first objective was to demonstrate that each of the beds making up these three sediment layers could have been de deposited rapidly under catastrophic conditions. You know, it's just, it would be arm waving just to say, oh, you know, these layers were deposited during the flood. But let's look at the evidence in these rock layers to show that it's it's consistent with it being deposited during the flood. And notice I chose my words carefully. We're not trying to prove from the scientific evidence that the Bible is right. No, we start with the Bible because God was there. He saw what happened. He told us what happened. So that's our starting point when we go out and look at the evidence. And, and so we want to know whether uh, the evidence does confirm what we read in God's word, that these layers were deposited under catastrophic conditions during the flood. And now, let me just pause here and again repeat what I said in the last session. You know, we get accused of being biased. You know, you go to the, the evidence with a preconceived view that the Bible is right after all. We are, on the other hand, we're unbiased and, you know, we go to the rocks and the rocks show millions of years. No, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. The scientists who believe in millions of years interpret the rocks already based on that belief. It's easy to demonstrate uh, that these scientists already have their own worldview. They have a, a pair of glasses like I have a pair of glasses, not always physical, of course, but mental glasses. They already believe in millions of years of slow and gradual processes when they go to study the rocks in the Grand Canyon. They're not neutral. They also have a bias. And so they want the evidence to fit their bias just as we're, as we're looking at the evidence through our bias, through biblical glasses. And the issue is, which is the best bias to be biased with anyway? Which bias is confirmed by the evidence, okay? So the first step in this research project 
was to demonstrate that each of these three layers, the Tapit Sandstone, the Bright Angel Shale and the Muav Slimestone were all formed catastrophically during the flood. And so I had to look at the evidence and present the evidence in three different scientific papers. Okay, This is why this research took so long, because I had to document every step of the reasoned arguments. And so, for example, in demonstrating that these layers were formed under catastrophic conditions, I looked at the structuring of these layers, Okay, how these layers were stacked up, how the how the layers related to one another, their internal features, etc. And I had to look at the fossils found in these layers. And so that meant field observations as well as looking in the literature. Okay. And that's exactly what I did. And uh, so uh, then after I after I presented that information uh, in those three papers, you know, looked at the structure of the rock layers. Then I looked at the at the uh, fossils. Uh, we had to then start the work on examining these layers. Okay, so fifty three fist size samples were collected, and this was important as well because this information informed the defence that these layers were formed during the flood. And that's why I'm going to go through the research approach before I show you some of the information that was in these papers okay so the first piece of equipment so these rocks were sent to the lab a piece of of, of each rock sample was broken off and it was crushed and it was put into a, a machine called an x-ray diffractometer to do uh, x-ray diffraction analyses okay what on earth is that it's a big word well let me explain it to you okay the rocks are made up of minerals uh, that have, crystal, have a crystalline structure. Each mineral is different from one another because they've got different ap- atoms aligned in a different crystalline structure. And so when the X-rays pass through the crushed rock, the X-rays behave differently according to what the crystal structure of the different minerals are. And so we can find out from this process, which minerals are actually in these rocks, and also the different amounts of minerals. And so that's like doing an overall analysis of the rock to find out what minerals in the rocks and how much of each mineral is in the rock, okay? And that's that's great to set up because then when I start to examine the rock under the microscope, I can confirm that I'm, I'm see, what I'm seeing, that I'm understanding the details correctly. So the first step was a crushed portion of the rock doing this X-ray diffraction analysis. And then thin sections were prepared. And there now I have a, here a microscope slide that you can see. Uh, this is the, the Tapit Sandstone. Now, now look how thin it is. It has to be this thin so the light passes through. And so we can examine the grains and the texture under the microscope, okay? That's what it looks like. How do we do that? Well, it's I had to do it when I was doing my PhD research. I had to make my own thin sections. It's a very laborious process, but we got the lab to prepare these for us. And uh, it was an easy, it's a, it's a very simple process, but it's laborious, okay? we You cut off, you use a diamond saw, okay? Because it's the diamond tipping, blade is hard enough to be able to cut through any rock you cut a slice of that rock a thin slice you glue it, glue it to a glass a microscope slide okay and in this case you can see that there's a blue dye blue dye okay the reason for that is that before the slice was cut and ground down uh, after after the thick slice was cut before it was ground down, glued to the glass slide and ground down, it was impregnated under pressure with epoxy resin that had a blue dye. And the reason for that is we didn't want the diamond saw and the grinding to disturb the grains. We wanted to freeze them in place. The epoxy was supposed to fill up all the pore spaces, the holes between the grains, 
so they didn't move to, against one another because we wanted to see the relationship of the grains to one another under the microscope, the textures, okay? Because that's very important because un, in the bending, in the bending, the texture should be different if it was, if the rock was already hard compared to elsewhere. And so we had to be very careful. So after the slice is, is glued to the glass slide, it's ground down till it's paper thin. A standard thickness, 30 microns, about the thickness of a human hair. And under, the, under that thickness, okay, you can see, I'm going to put it under the microscope here. We've got a light source down below here. It shines up through the glass slide. It's paper thin so that the light comes through. And here we've got the, the lenses that we can look through, the eyepieces. And up here, we can mount a camera to take photographs of what we're seeing. And I haven't got the camera mounted here, but that imagine a camera up here. And I'm going to show you some photographs. Everyone understands that geologists are strange people. We do things differently. We're odd. Uh, but that's okay. I'm happy to wear the label. And so a geological microscope is different from a biological microscope. You know, all microscopes have a light source and a stage and the, the thin section or the glass slide with a sample on it and then the magnifying eyepiece uh, and then up here, the column and the objective, okay? And so what's the difference? Well, uh, the geological microscope has two further components. Underneath here, between the light source and the slide on the stage, we have what is called a Polaroid lens. What's a Polaroid? Well, everyone is familiar with sunglasses. You know, there's a brand of, called Polaroid sunglasses, or used to be. Uh, and basically, you know, it's, they're dark, of course, uh, because it, it's designed to cut down the glare from the sun. And how does it do that? Well, a Polaroid lens, it, it's like a grate. You know, you've got a, well, the vent, the vent on your, um, on your air conditioner coming out, uh, it, it controls the air, okay? And it's got, it's got these, these, uh, uh, these vertical bars, okay? And what happens is that, that light vibrates in all different directions. And so the Polaroid having these bars, as it were, this, this grating or these, uh, 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 this, that controls the light, only light that is parallel to the, the bars, so to speak, gets through. So it cuts down the glare when it's on your eyes, okay? But on the microscope, it only allows light to come through the glass slide that is vibrating in the one direction, okay? And so that's fine under normal conditions. The sample looks the same under the microscope as without that. But we also have another Polaroid lens above the objective lens before you get to the eyepiece up here, okay? And that Polaroid lens can either have the the bars, as it were, parallel to the Polaroid lens down the bottom, in which case all the light still comes through, or you can cross them like this so they, they, they cancel one another out. And so it means that if you have no glass slide with a rock on it underneath the microscope, you don't see any light coming through at the eyepiece, even though the, the light source here is blasting out light full ball. Okay? And why is that significant? Well, as soon as you put the glass slide under there, the different minerals have the ability to actually rotate the, the light plane. And different minerals rotate it by different amounts. And so instead of seeing darkness up here, in the eyepiece, you see all different colors and features in the rock that you wouldn't see normally with a normal microscope. And so you've got these two Polaroid lens. You've either got the, the top one in or out. They're either normal light or crossed polars. And so 
you might hear the, the geologists talking about that, but that's the significance of a geologist, and it allows you to examine the features. So, for example, if a, a mineral grain has been under stress, okay, and metallurgists are familiar with this term, you know, you can you can look at you can get a piece of metal and you know put it under stress. And then when you examine it under a microscope, you can see the stress lines and the stress features. Well, <clears throat> under cross polars, you can see the stress features, say, in a quartz grain. A quartz is the mineral that's in sandstone. And so that's significant because, you see, in setting up this contrast in this project, <clears throat> remember, were the minerals were the rocks metamorphosed by heat and pressure over millions of years or changed to make them plastic so they could bend smoothly? We ought to be able to see stress in the grains. We ought to see where the grains had moved past one another, where the cement had been put under stress. There's a whole list of features that we ought to see under the microscope. Okay, so that that was why we had to go to this detailed level. And then sample pieces, pieces of each sample, were also prepared for viewing under a scanning electron microscope. Now, in, in, a, in a glass slide like this, looking under a, micro, a regular microscope, we see the samples in two dimensions. But in a scanning electron microscope, we can see the samples in three dimensions. And this is very important, as you'll see when we get to the results. Because <clears throat> a scanning electron microscope not only can go to a deep, dive down to a deeper magnitude, it can get the sample in three dimensions. And so what happens is you get a, a piece of sample broken off, you mount it on a slug, and on that broken sample, sample you spray a fine film of gold, not much at all, not worth very much at all, but the gold, of course, is because in the machine, you zap it, and I'll show you the machine in a moment, you zap it with electron, an electron beam, and so you got it, the electrons have got to be able to be conducted across the surface of the sample so that they can bounce back again and, and give you an image. And the image is in three dimensions, and the idea was to look at the cement in particular and the condition of the cement uh, in the that's in between the grains and look at the, the grains. And so they're the tools that we use to examine the content, the mineral contents, the textures, the cement, any signs of metamorphism in these samples. So here's the X-ray diffractometer. <clears throat> you can see it's computer controlled as it is, all equipment is these days. In that, in that box, that gray box, the sample goes in and it gets zapped with the X-rays and it sends out the results to the computer uh, with the image of the, of the different minerals and how much of the minerals are so that you can estimate them. Uh, these are the thin sections. Some of the thin sections, you can see again the blue dye that, that was the epoxy resin that was designed to impregnate the samples to make sure we didn't disturb the grains. <clears throat> when we cut them, the rocks, and we ground them, <clears throat> excuse me, until we ground them till they are paper thin. <clears throat> here again, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the geological microscopes we used on the left is this one here that I've got here, which is just a regular benchtop microscope. On the right, you've got a research quality uh, geological microscope. We needed to take photographs to document everything. You know, the papers that I've produced have got, got tens of photographs in them uh, because, you know, I could claim that a particular feature is in one in every sample, but if I only showed a photograph from one sample, people could say, oh, you've cherry-picked the data. So we had to, had to photograph every sample. In fact, I spent hours and hours, hundreds of hours, going through each of these samples line by line, section by section, photographs at every point, writing notes at every point to document every feature so I could go back, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, this work was meticulously done. And then here's the scanning electron microscope. 
Okay, you can see that column there on the left. Uh, and you can see the sample is, is he's the operator there. He's got this, the little sample with the uh, gold coating. You can see some of the samples in the foreground there in that silver dish. Uh, they're mounted and put into uh, that sample holder there that's pushed in. And then an electron beam in that column on the left. And it bounces off to those detectors that are seen on either side. And then the detectors send the image. And over on the right-hand computer screen there, you can see the electron image that comes out with the three-dimensional. I'm going to show you some of these. So this is quite sophisticated equipment. So why I'm going to the trouble of going through all these details is to show you that creation scientists do real scientific research. We use the same equipment with samples collected in the field that every other scientist does. And we process these samples in exactly the same way as a university scientist would do. So we are real scientists. Just because we believe the Bible is true from the very first verse doesn't mean that, that we leave our brains at the door of the church. No, we use our brains like God has asked us to and commands us to use our brains to examine the world around us so that we can better be better stewards of the world that God has gave us. So what were the findings? So let's back up a minute. Let's look at, for example, the evidence that these layers formed rapidly, catastrophically during the flood. I can't, haven't got time to go through all the layers. So I'm just going to pick this first layer, the Tapete Sandstone. Uh, what do we find? Well, at the base of the Pete's, Tapete Sandstone, we find boulders, boulders the size of houses and cars. Now, to move boulders that size, requires fast moving water and a lot of fast moving waters and the layering in the tapete sandstone uh, with these boulders is consistent with rapid hurricane or tsunami driven transport and deposition what do i mean by tsunami well everybody knows what happens uh, when you get an earthquake say what happened off the coast of japan in march uh, 2011. There was an earthquake offshore. The earthquake disturbed the ocean floor. It generated a wave, okay, an earthquake wave. We call them a tsunami. And because that's a Japanese term, it means harbour wave. But we've, we've commandeered that term into English. And what happens, it comes up on shore, it picks up sediment, and with devastating consequence, okay? Hurricanes also drive ocean waves very rapidly with water currents up onto the coastline. And we've seen that happen. We can, we've examined it happen in real world events like in Japan, sadly, uh, when it was devastating consequences. And also off the east coast of the United States when a hurricane crosses the coast and the water gets driven inland and deposits layers, okay? So... The evidence in these rock layers is consistent with rapid deposition, uh, transport and deposition at hurricane velocity, tsunami driven uh, transport and deposition. And also, for example, in the Tapete sandstone, we, and I'll show you a photograph in a moment, we find the, the traces of crawling traces and the burrowing traces of trilobites and worms. And we find evidence of other animals uh, like um, clams, evidence of where they scurried across or buried into the surfaces of this sediment as it was being, as it was being deposited. Now you might say, but, but that, that takes millions of years. No, 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 no. If, if the, the traces are, are very rapidly formed and unless they are buried rapidly, they get obliterated. I mean, think about your footprints. If you walked across along a beach, are your footprints going to be survive for hundreds of years before they're slowly buried and then become fossilized? No. The wind blows on the sand, the, water, the waves pound on the beach, uh, and those, those footprints are obliterated very, very rapidly. So if you are going to bury the traces of trilobites and worms and clams, 
then it's going to have to be very, very rapid burial. And that's exactly what the evidence shows. Rapid. Uh, I mean, these were critters that were alive when the flood came and they were trying to survive during this process and they were running along the, the, the surfaces of the sediments before they got nailed and buried. Okay, here's a photograph of some of these boulders. These are small in comparison to some of the ones you find. That's at the base of the Tapete Sandstone. You can see the hand on the right there for scale. Boulders like that need fast-moving waters to be transported. Here's the layering in the Tapete Sandstone. Uh, you can see how there's sort of troughs and uh, wish every which way. You know, things seem to be haphazard there, but there's an overall layering. I remember taking a, a geologist colleague into the canyon and showing in showing him these uh, this layering in the Tapete Sandstone. He said to me, "That's exactly what we see in sand layers washed up by a hurricane on the east coast of the United States. Exactly the same." So he agreed immediately that these layers, looking like that, had to have been deposited by hurricane-driven rapid flow of water. And so here's these trilobite crawling traces we find in the Tapete Sandstone. These trilobites, you know, they've got a shell, and underneath the shell they've got these little flippers, and they scurry across the sand surface. And as they dig into the sand to get traction, they leave these traces. And they've been, they've been buried. By the way, it's interesting that the actual creature, the creatures that made these tracks, were buried in layers hundreds of feet higher. Let that sink in for a moment. You had to bury these traces rapidly to, for them to survive, to, uh, to be preserved for us to see now. If it, was, if it was millions of years or even thousands of years between the creature leaving the trace, and then it being buried, the creature wouldn't be thousands of years old, the one that left the traces. You see what I mean? It rules out lots of, lots of time immediately. The, the traces were left, the, was buried very rapidly, and then the creature was buried maybe an hour later. After tens of feet, hundreds of feet more uh, sediments were deposited. And by the way, this is a feature that's found commonly in the, in the record, the footprints of dinosaurs are found in layers 10, 15, 30 million years sometimes before we actually find the bones of the creatures that made the footprints. It doesn't make sense if there were millions of years between. But during the flood, with rapid accumulation of these layers, you need rapid burial to preserve the footprints. You need rapid burial to preserve the worm trails, you need rapid burial to preserve the bones of these creatures, okay? The flood makes perfect sense of the evidence, okay? And here's some of these burrows. <laughs> Why are they U-shaped? Well, even the secularists call them escape burrows. The critter was going down and then suddenly realized, wait a minute, there's all these sediments coming up here on top. I better get out of here quickly, otherwise I'm going to be buried alive. So he does a U-turn and tries to escape. And these are common in the Tapete Sandstone. So we don't have to go time to go through all these layers, but you can go to the papers, and I'll mention where the papers are at the end of this presentation. If you want all this technical information, it's available for you. I've been very careful to document all this so that anyone can be armed with this information to to give a witness for what we believe about the truth of God's word. Okay, so that was the first stage. For each of these three layers, the Tapete Sandstone, the Bright Angel uh, Shale, and the Muav Limestone, to demonstrate that each of these layers were formed rapidly during the flood only thousands of years ago. Okay, then of course we also found, added to that, another piece of evidence is that um, if the process occurred rapidly, then all the different sizes of grains, say of sand, would be mixed up because there wouldn't have been time in settling for the grains to settle out. You know, you take, you take a mixture of grain sizes, say silt and sand and water in a glass jar and put the lid on and shake it all up. If you give them time, 
the, the, the heavier grains or larger grains will settle first and you'll separate the finer grains from the coarser grains. Well, if deposition was rapid, there'll be no time for sorting of the grains and so all the sizes would be mixed up rapidly. And if there was a long period of time, the grains would have been transported and rolled around just like pebbles on the bottom of a stream. They get rounded. You'd expect the grains to be rounded. But if it was very rapid, you'd expect the grains not to be very rounded at all because there was no time to, to complete the rounding. And so what did we find? Here's some of these grains. See, that's what it looks like, this sandstone under the microscope. Um, you can see here very large grains, large grains and small grains, all different sizes mixed up. Those white grains are the mineral quartz. It's silicon dioxide. It's exactly the same as window glass. Okay. In fact, to make window glass, you take pure quartz sand and melt it and then extrude it as bottles or, or glass window panes. It's the same mineral. And so here it is. You can see the different size grains. Okay. And so there was no time for sorting. Uh, again, here's the different size grains. And there's other features there that we'll come back to. But you can see there's different sizes. That's the point we're making here. And uh, there's different minerals. Um, there's the mineral felspar, K felspar, that K stands for potassium. It's the symbol for potassium. And it's a different type of felspar to some other types. It's actually, you know, you can sometimes get pink granites. The pink mineral is potassium felspar. Okay. And here you can see there's different sizes, different grains. And so uh, while the sandstone was primarily made up of quartz grains, it also consistently had potassium felspar grains in it. And uh, they're often also not rounded and they were also of different sizes. And here's the interesting thing. Because these, the potassium felspar grains are softer than quartz, if it was slow and gradual transport and deposition, the harder quartz would have crushed these softer grains. But the very fact that the softer potassium felspar has survived indicates that the transport process, the deposition process, was very rapid. And furthermore, we know where these grains came from because just down further in the canyon, we find the granites from which the potassium felspar was eroded. So it was only a very short distance of transport and therefore very little erosion deposited in these. So there's one of these uh, felspar grains in this sandstone. You can see uh, there's a little bit of a crystal shape there on the upper, uh, upper surface there. And to the right, you can see a little bit of crystal shape, but elsewhere it's, it's a bit rounded. And here's some more of these grains here. They've survived. Well, furthermore, something that was incredibly surprising is there are abundant flakes of the white, white mica mineral called muscovite. Uh, this mineral is made up of very thin sheets. Uh, it, you know, if you go to a beach in, in some places, you can see these little silvery flakes on a beach. That's the, the white muscovite mineral it's a very thin uh, it's got little flakes flaky mineral and you can pick it up and you can peel apart those little sheets and it's very 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 soft and because it's very soft it's and fragile it is easily destroyed in fact ex observations for example uh off the west coast of south africa uh where the Sand is washed up on the beach. It's got muscovite in it. Just behind the beach are dunes, desert sand dunes. Uh, and in 100 feet where the wind blows to make the dunes, all the mica is, is crushed. It's crushed. That's how quickly. Uh, there's no mica in the sand in the dune, but there's mica in the beach sand that was picked up by the wind to make the dune. So the rubbing of the harder grains wipes out these uh, muscovite flakes and so an uh, interesting thing is these muscovite flakes were also found wedged between 
the quartz and felspar grains, and it was often parallel to the bedding. Here's one of these flakes. This is a remember this a cut through section, and you can see how it's been bent at one end because they're soft, uh, but it survived. And it's wedged in there between the grains. And in other places, you can see where the ends have been frayed. And so this is a very significant finding. These, this soft mineral had survived. It could only survive if it was a short distance of transport and it was exceedingly rapid. And, of course, in water, remember I mentioned the west coast of the observations, the west coast of southern Africa? Well, some of that sand has also been transported by the ocean currents to the north. And when it gets deposited a thousand miles further to the north onto the beach, it still has the mica flakes in it because water cushions the grains with water in between. So the water transport will preserve the muscovite flakes. And so that's why we know that this was rapid water transport. Okay, and as I said before, some of these edge-on flakes, the edges have been split and they've been frayed or they've been bent or broken. And, you know, this sounds complicated, but the reason I'm pointing this out, you'll see later, when we contrast what we see in the bends of the fold compared to the distance samples, okay? So stay with me. This is not, this is not rocket science. It's very easy to understand once it's... it's carefully explained to you. Now, when we see that these flakes are still uh, are bent and they're frayed edges, they're still that way, that means that these muscovite flakes are still in the condition in which they were transported, deposited, and, and formed into the rock. And we call that term detrital. Detritus is all the crumbly debris that's transported by the water. And so it means that these muscovite flakes, these mica flakes, are still in the pristine condition in which they occurred when they were picked up by the water and transported and deposited in this sandstone. And that's significant because we want to see whether these muscovite flakes are still in pristine condition in the layer, in the samples away from the folds and whether it's the same in the folds. Because if they're still in their pristine original condition in the fold, that means the bending took place before the hardening, while they were still soft, okay? That's why it's significant to go into all these technical details. So let me show you again. See the bending of this muscovite flake? You can see down the bottom right-hand corner in this image under the microscope, this was taken on this microscope here, okay, with the camera mounted up the top there. You can see the split ends, okay. The, 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 the sheets were pulled apart. Now, you would think if heat and pressure had been applied to that rock, then it would have healed. It would have healed that split end. The heat and pressure would have reformed the muscovite to be back in its pristine original condition from when it was in the granite okay so that's that's what we're looking at look at these flakes they've been bent and these are thick ones they've been altered as well so that's what we're looking at and then what did we find the cement binding of the grains together is primarily primarily of the mineral quartz this is in the sandstone so when the water in the in the holes remember i I, I said before in our previous session that sandstone is like a bucket of golf balls. You know, the grains are the golf balls. And in between the golf balls, you've got a space. And when the, when the sand is deposited, there's still the water in the spaces. And that water has, has chemicals dissolved in it. And when the water dries out, the chemicals crystallize and fill in the spaces between the grains. Okay? and forms the cement. And uh, that's what's happening in concrete, man-made concrete as well. We have the sand and, and gravel. We have a cement that's in the water with the water. And then after it's deposited on your driveway, the water dries out, the cement 
grows in between all the sand and, and, and gravel and it hardens it into a hard rock, okay? And so uh, under the microscope, we can see what the cement is and it's, it's also silica, okay? Silica was also, that is the same mineral as quartz, the same as in window glass. You know, silica can be dissolved in water as a gel and in some places around the world, that gel, when it when it forms, uh, hard uh, when it comes out of solution, forms the mineral or the the gem opal in Australia. That's that's quartz, okay? And it's come out of it's silica that's come out of water. Uh, agates the same. Chalcedony. They're all varieties of quartz precipitated from water that's been in the ground, okay? And so uh, this silica cement formed. And what did we find using the geological microscope, using the scan electron microscope? We can see that the cement in all the samples, whether distant or in the folds, was still pristine and had not had been disturbed or shattered since it grew, it grew to harden the sandstone. Okay. And the other interesting observation was. Remember, I talked about the golf balls and the spaces between the golf balls or the spaces between the sandstone, the sand grains. We call that the porosity or the pores. Okay. And so uh, that's why we looked at the blue dye. You know, we put the blue dye in because under the microscope, where there was blue dye between the grains, that's where there's pore spaces. And, and we want to know how much pore spaces were in because you think about it. In the bend, okay, the pressure should have squeezed out those pore spaces so that in the bends, there should be fewer pore spaces than elsewhere. The porosity would be different. Hmm, that's interesting. And so what did we find? We found that there was no difference in the porosity. There was no difference in the, in the cement. There hadn't been all this change and shattering. Uh, that would occur, even grains moving relative to one another if the, if the rock had become plastic. We found that there was no evidence of metamorphism. So let, let, let me walk you through some of this. I've got a few pictures here to show, and we're, show you. And we're focusing on the sandstone because it's easier for you to see this, okay? And so that's what was bent in the Carbon Canyon fold and the Monument fold, okay? So let me walk you through this photograph. You can see the quartz grains there. I've labeled them quartz grain in red. Okay. So let's look at the grain up there in the top, the two grains in the top right hand corner. Notice that within the white, near the edge of the white area, there's a black streaky line. Okay. And you can trace that all the way around the grain and the one on the right. And then next to that, on the other side of that black line, I've got a yellow asterisk. Okay, what are we looking at? Well, that black line, you know, a grain of sand, as it sits out there and as it gets transported, it's going to get dirty. Okay, and essentially that black line is the dirt on the outline surface of the original grain, sand grain that, that was deposited, the original golf ball. Okay. And what happened is you can see that, well, look at that second quartz grain at the top there to the left. You know, got the one on the right on the edge of the image, the one to the, just the left of it. If you go to the next grain to the left of it, you can see the outline of its shape and you can see it's pressed against that other grain. But in between was the pore space. And in that pore space, you've got where the asterisk is and it's the same white material. That's the quartz cement. The quartz cement grew into the pore space and grew over the original detrital, the original sediment quartz grain. Okay, so we call them overgrowths. That's the term. They grow over. And you can see that in other, look where I've highlighted in other places in that image. You can see a, a felspar grain there. You can see a muscovite flake there. But you can see all through, and there's still pore spaces, by the way. See the blue areas? That's where the epoxy can be seen. 
where the where the pore stasis didn't get filled in, and you can see the cement grew into the into the spaces. Okay, and here's another example. Okay, this shows very clearly the different size quartz grains. You can see the black outlines, and you can see the cement that's grown in between to fill in the pore spaces. And in this instance, so that for clarity, I've got the orange colored asterisks. Okay, now let's look at the quartz grains and the cement. On the right, we've got an image from the hinge zone, the bend zone in the Carbon Canyon Fold. CCF stands for Carbon Canyon Fold. And then on the left, you've got a regional sample for tens of miles from that fold. Look at the difference. I mean, I know the one on the left is a little bit darker in colour. I didn't use Photoshop on that to lighten it up, but I could have to make it the same whiteness. But we're looking at the quality of the grains. You can still see the same outlines. You can still see the same pore spaces. You can see that the grains have not been disturbed. They're still in their original positions in which they were deposited, in the original positions in which they were cemented. They haven't been moved around. And they haven't been metamorphosed or disturbed or shattered, either in the fold or out of the fold. Okay, here's a table. Don't get confused too much. I've tried to highlight there. On the right, you can see I've highlighted a regional sample and a limb and a hinge and a limb sample from the Carbon Canyon fold. On the right, you can see the porosities. Look at the regional sample porosity of approximately 5.5% of that surface on the microscope slide is pore spaces. Look at the sample in the middle there at the bottom in the hinge. In the bend zone, it's still approximately 5% porosity. It's the, virtually the same porosity. It hasn't changed. The, the golf balls haven't been pushed together so hard that it's squeezed out the pore spaces. Okay, that means the whole process was very rapid and there was little time between deposition and, and, and folding. Okay, this, this, is, this is astounding results. This is objective results. Here's the hinge zone, okay, again of the Carbon Canyon fold. And these are the three samples that I just con contrasted. The two limb samples there on either side where the men are and the hinge sample. That hinge sample had a 5% porosity. The, the one on either side, one had a similar porosity and the regional sample had a similar porosity. Okay. And here again, here's, the, here's those three samples. You know, number nine, uh, a limb sample. Number 11, a, hinge, uh, a, a, a limb sample. Number 10, a hinge sample. And then the regional sample. Again, you can, you can see that, that they're all the same. Under the microscope, you see these quartz grains. You can see the original outlines. They haven't moved relative to one another. The cement's in pristine condition. You know, all the observations that we've been talking about are repeated in every, every sample, in every, every slide, in every, every view. Okay. And sometimes the rock, sam the rock fabric had become a solid mass. Why? Because the interlocking quartz, uh, the, the interlocking quartz grains had been cemented so that they were dist indistinguishable and there were no pore spaces like in this image here, okay? Now, if the bending had occurred, this, is, this means the rock is all cemented, okay? The cement has grown in so much that it's locked all these grains in together. If the cement, if the, sorry, if the uh, bending took place after this cementation, wouldn't you expect to, all these grains to be dislodged and moved against one another and, and broken? Absolutely. But everything's still in pristine condition. In other words, the cement was the last thing to form, the last thing. And that's exactly what we predicted based on our biblical understanding of these layers in the Grand Canyon and of these folds. Here's another example where the cementation has been so intense that there's no pore spaces left and th th yet the grains have not been disturbed as a consequence of the bending, okay? So the rock had to be bent after the cement had been set hard and so the masses of cement sand grains, quartz grains, 
didn't show any signs of being shattered or broken and then re-cemented. There's no evidence of any of that. Furthermore, there's no evidence of any metamorphic changes to the sandstone or any of its consistent consist, uh, constituent minerals and grains, either in the folds or miles away from the folds. For example, the felspar, okay? The felspar and the muscovite mica should have been affected by heat and pressure, but they're not. I mean, here they are. There's no shattering of the quartz grains. They're cemented together, and the felspar grains and the muscovite flakes, not only don't they show any signs of metamorphism, they're still in their original deposited condition. As I said before, the trital condition. The muscovite flakes are still bent. When the golf balls landed together and the grains were squashed between those grains, they were bent around the grains because the flakes are soft and flexible. And, and some of the ends of the fl were frayed and split apart. You can see that in the right-hand image. That's, that's from the limb, uh, two samples from the limbs. Okay, on the left there. Now let's look at the one in the in the uh, in the hinge. There's another muscovite flake on the rock, still the same with the frayed frayed end. It hasn't been metamorphosed. The the felspar flakes are still exactly the same. You can see the the rounding. You can see uh, the original detrital condition. Nothing. The grains haven't been shattered. The cement hasn't been shattered. It's exactly the same. And, and as I've already been highlighting, there's no evidence of the grain sliding past one another. And, and there's no indication of stress on the grains. You remember I mentioned before about, you know, metallurgists take metal and you, you can bend it and then you can look at it under the mic microscope and, or in a special light condition, you can see the stress features. Well, it's the same with uh, these quartz grains. Under the microscope, when we cross the polars, remember I talked about that before, okay, we're going to see this, a stressed quartz grain will have what we call undulose extinction. And that's a technical term. It just means there'll be variations in the light and coloration of the grain surface, okay? It'll vary across the surface. If there's no stress, the grain will look all the same all the way across. If there's been stress, you'll see disturbance of the surface uh, features, okay? And that should be there. In fact, if you go to the literature, which I did, and I've got all the references in my paper, my papers, if you go to the literature, any quartz grain that's been under stress due to what they call ductile deformation under heat and pressure slowly, it should have undulose extinction, okay? But it didn't. Here's the, here's the uh, normal light photograph. On the right is on the hinge in the quartz, in the carbon canyon fold. On the left is the regional sample, again, of the quartz, okay? You can see, again, the original outline with the dirty outline. You can see the cement overgrowth filling in that pore. It hasn't been disturbed in either sample. You know, if I mixed these samples up and didn't have them labeling labeled, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between what came from the, the hinge and what came from miles away. There's absolutely no difference, okay? And here is it under, under cross polars, okay? See what I mean about different light conditions? No light should get through under cross polars. But look, you get these variegated colours in these quartz grains. You can see the, see the interesting colours of the muscovite flake on the left there. That's how we know it's muscovite. So it's got a pretty colour there. Um, you know, studying these minerals under the microscopes is a lot of fun because you see all these beautiful colours. Um, but it tells you, tells, gives you details. It's clues. Okay. And look at the surface of these grains. There's no variation in the, in the, in the surface. The surface is the same colour all the way across each of those grains. And then we went to the scanning electron microscope. You know, I'm, I'm getting passionate and excited about this. Well, I ought to be because here we have evidence that confirms God's word. 
And so these detailed scanning electric mi electron microscope images were designed to compare the condition of the quartz cement in the folds, both in the hinge zone, the bend zone, and the limb zone, that is, to the, to the away from the bend, and then in the samples miles away, okay? So let me show you this example, these examples here. On the right, carbon canyon fold image number, sample number two is in the hinge zone there, a bend zone, okay? Carbon canyon sample number eight is way out there to the left on the limb zone, okay? How do these look under the microscope, the scan electron microscope? There they are. And you can see, see those pointy, pointy uh, ends, terminations. You know, you're all familiar. I don't know whether you're familiar with um, amethyst. Okay, sometimes you see amethyst crystals in a rock shop, a mineral shop, in a, in a museum. The amethyst crystal, amethyst is quartz, okay, with a little bit of purple discoloration in it because of manganese, okay, and it's a gemstone. Or you can get regular clear quartz grains, okay, and they grow in columns. At the top of the column, you've got these sharp terminations. It's a hexagonal prism with this pointy end. Well, that's exactly what we're seeing here in under the scan electron microscope. See those pointy ends? That's where the quartz that, that came from the, the water between the sand grains, between the golf balls, when it dried out and the quartz crystallized, the quartz grew on top of and between these sand grains and it grew sequentially into the pore spaces and grew these nice, pristine terminations. Now, if the cement had a, like this had occurred before the bending, those terminations would have been destroyed. The, the cement would have had to regrow. You'd see evidence of two generations of growth of the cement. But no, we only see one generation and the, and the cement is in pristine condition. That means the cementation, the, the hardening, had to be the last step in the process. Okay, here's, uh, here's two more samples, okay, in this part of the fold. Number 10 is right in the bend zone. Number 11 is nearby in the limb zone. Let's contrast. This. Look at the spectacular crystals there on the left in that limb zone sample, but they're there on the right too, okay? Just above the label where I've got quartz cement crystals, you can see lovely termination ends on, on those on the on in that image by the way you can see some rough surfaces there and that's the re the reason for that is because when the sample is prepared for the scanning electron microscope you have to break apart break apart the rock so you're going to break apart the cement as well so you'll get some rough parts as well as the termination so you know don't get be, be fooled or get put off we can see the beautiful growth of these crystals which indicate that it had to be the last, the cement had to be last. Uh, here's the uh, monument fold, and you can see the two samples, uh, beds that were sampled. Here they are. I, I've got two sets of samples here, hinge and limb, again, to, to show you that it's in every sample. I'm not cherry picking the data, okay? On the left is a limb sample. On the right is a hinge sample. You can see the same quartz cement terminations, okay? Here's two more, a hinge in the fold, uh, a limb, and you can see again uh, the, the, the nice pristine uh, terminations in the quartz cement crystals. Now, there's other features there that I don't have time to, to go into, but it's all explained in, in great detail in the, in the papers, the technical papers. And just for completeness sake, let's look at some regional samples, okay? Just to remind you, there's the, the Carbon Canyon fold and the Monument fold in which the Tapete sandstone was bent. And here's the regional samples, T -T TSS, Tapete sandstone sample one, two, and three regional samples. And let's look at these under the microscope. Here's numbers one and two. Look, the same pristine cement crystals, quartz crystals, terminations. 
and number three. So every sample is, you know, if I if I didn't have labels on these and mixed them all up and said which sample Andrew came, Dr. Andrew came from the fold, which sample came from the limb, which sample came from the hinge, I wouldn't be able to tell you the difference because there's no difference in any of these features, okay? So, you know, this is exciting. I want to wrap up here, but I want to give you one, some other final pieces of evidence because there were other observations. You know, I've had other research projects in the Grand Canyon, and it's interesting how God uses different research combined with later research to help that later research uh, come to good conclusions, okay? And there was other evidence that I found on previous research projects that indicate that the temperatures in the Tapit Sandstone, the Bright Angel Shale, and the Muav never got warm enough to metamorphose the rocks anyway, okay? Never got warm enough to make the rock plastic, contrary to the assertions of our opponents that say it took place over hundreds of millions of years, okay? Well, the first one is radio halos. That are they, those are halos in a rock, in a, in, a, in the muscovite, sorry, in the mica flakes, the biotite mica flakes, uh, due to radiation. And these were in the crystalline basement rocks. Remember, I mentioned in our last session that the peat sandstone sits on top of an erosion surface, and underneath are the pre-flood rocks that include the original crystalline basement rocks that are the foundation of the North American continent. And those have been eroded to provide some of the debris, including the mica and the potassium feldspar flakes that are in the sandstone. And by the way, the feldspar and mica flakes are not only in the sandstone, they're in the, in the shale and they're in the limestone. I haven't seen nowhere in the literature where muscovite flakes have been documented in limestone. All three rock units had to for, therefore form rapidly so that the muscovite could survive through the deposition of the previous layers, survive until it gets to the limestone. So there's so much evidence. It's so exciting to be able to share this with you and to encourage you to dig deeper and get armed with this information. Well, I'll show you some photographs in a moment so you know what I mean. But these radio halos, we know from experimental evidence elsewhere that they disappear if the rock gets heated above 150 degrees Celsius. That's a little over the boiling point of water, which geologically is not very hot. Um, and so that's, that's interesting that these radio halos have survived, which means these rocks, the last time they were heated, never got above 150 degrees C. And then, that's Celsius, and then in, in grains within the quartz, and also in zircon grains elsewhere, we found fission tracks. What, what are fission tracks? Well, uranium atoms, you all, you all know that uranium atoms split in a nuclear reactor to produce the heat that is used to boil water that then generates steam that, ge that then powers the turbines. That's what happens in a nuclear power station. Some, atom, uh, some uranium atoms split. Okay, and when they split apart, the two fragments damage the crystal on either side of the original split atom and leave a track. We call that a fission track, and we can see it under the microscope. And those fission tracks, if the rock gets heated, it will, they will also disappear because in both instances, what happens? When they're heated, the atoms that have been pushed aside by the radiation damage snap back into their original position. And so the, the, the damage, it gets, disappears. And then the third piece of evidence we disco I've discovered is that the clay minerals, the clay minerals in the, in the, in the sandstone, because they're there and in all these rocks, if there's a particular mixture of clay minerals, it will also be a temperature indicator. And so let me show you. These are the fission tracks we found in in uh, a sandstone in, in the Tapit sandstone, actually in a in a, a Carbon Canyon limfold sample. Here's the zircon grains that were extracted and the fission tracks on the right in a volcanic ash bed. Uh, here are the 
here are the clay clay uh, components. Th these are clay. This was derived from uh, boreholes originally. The, this experimental curve was derived from boreholes in oil drilling in the Me Gulf of Mexico. And uh, we can see that the where the samples from the Tapete sandstone fit, it shows you the depth and it also shows the temperature. Well, what does this show? It shows that the temperatures did not get high enough to metamorphose the rocks, never even ro rose to a, a to temperature significant enough to, to call, cause any metamorphic changes. Well, our time is done. I need to wrap this up with the conclusions. Um, there's a lot more that I could say. All the information is in the paper that I'll come to. But let's let's get to the conclusions of this re research. And you already should have heard me, but I'm going to repeat them because repetition helps them get them impregnated in your brains. All the observational evidence absolutely does not support the folding occurring 450, 450 million years after these sediment layers were deposited and cemented. Okay, the the uh, conventional wisdom is that these layers were deposited 500 million years ago, and then they were hardened and cemented, and then the folding took place 450 million years later. No, the evidence, all the observation evidence, does not support that the folding took place 450 million years after the layers were deposited, after they were cemented, so they became rock hard. Instead, the evidence is overwhelmingly consistent with rapid catastrophic deposition of these sediment layers at the beginning of the global cataclysmic flood year. Okay, the Bible tells us that the flood occurred recently, only 4,350 years ago. These layers would have formed in the first few weeks of the flood. They would have been buried with another layers that were still soft and wet as a consequence of all these layers stacked up with the waters over the, over, the, uh, over the earth. And then if the layers were then pushed up and bent where they were still soft as the flood ended and then they dried out, okay, only a year after they were deposited, then the cement would be formed last and us today studying that cement 4,350 years later without any further geological catastrophes or activities would expect to see the cement still in pristine condition. And that's exactly what we find. Isn't that exciting? It's incredibly exciting. It means that the bending occurred when the layers were still wet and soft, when the plateau was uplifted only 12 months later at the end of the flood year and it was followed by cementing of the sediment layers as they dried out at the end and after the flood. And that means this evidence wipes out over 500 million years of supposed geological time. No wonder, no wonder our opponents tried to stop this research happening. And you can learn about what they tried to do in, in the first se session that I presented. But this is exciting evidence, folks, that here we show by setting up a question, okay, the question is this, was it deposition of the sediment layers, hardening over millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, and then bending, okay, that's the conventional wisdom, okay, and we, we're setting up, a, that's the questions, a contrast, or was it Deposition of these sediment layers recently at the beginning of the flood year. Then they were bent while they were still soft and wet at the end of the flood as the waters were draining off and they hadn't had time to dry out. And then as they dried out at the end and after the flood, only a year after they were deposited, only 4,350 years or so ago, they hardened. The cement was the last thing. And so the answer, we set up these two questions we went and collected our samples. We looked at them under the microscopes. We analyzed the mineral grains. We made the observations. And we can dogmatically show that all the observations are not consistent. No, no, no to the hundreds of millions of years. Yes, yes, yes to the biblical flood only recently 
uh, just as the Bible presents it. So we're not proving the Bible. Again, let me emphasize, we're not proving the Bible. The Bible was the authority that we started with. The Bible tells us about the flood. The Bible tells us about the time scale. We take what the Bible says, and now as real scientists doing real research, we collected real samples, we did real analyses. You've seen the evidence, and we can therefore dogmatically assert that the evidence in God's world confirms what we read in God's word. Excited about that? I am. That's why I get so ex so I talk so animated, because I want you also to be armed with this evidence, okay? And so where can you find the information? Well, you're viewing this video on our website. So while you're there, go find this information. That's the place to go. The go-to for all information is on the Answers in Genesis website, answersingenesis.org, okay? And so we wrote, I wrote a lay article about this research describing the legal battle to get the lawsuit and get the sampling uh, samples, etc., with some of the preliminary results. And that was published in the January 2022 issue of Answers Magazine, which, of course, you can access online, and volume 17. And uh, I've got, there's a link there I've, I've provided for you, for us, but you can, you can easily find that. You know, go down the, the front page of the Answers in Genesis website, go down to the Answers Magazine, Click on Answers Magazine, go across to Answers Magazine website and find the archives, find this issue, and you'll get that article. So there it is. There it is. The fight for 53 rocks. And uh, that's a lay overview of this research project and the history of it. And uh, even with that article, uh, you'll be able to answer the, the uh, present this information. But of course, we need also the technical papers. And I said there's seven papers in all. Uh, five have been published. That's the three based on the, um, uh, the evidence that each of these three layers were catastrophically deposited rapidly during the flood. And so there are, these are all published in the Answers Research Journal. And it's also available on the Answers in Genesis website. Okay, again, you can scroll down to the bottom of the Answers in Genesis website. And down the bottom on the right, you'll see Answers Research Journal. You click on that and you'll go straight to the home page of the Answers Research Journal. And what's exciting about the Answers Research Journal, not only is it a peer-reviewed technical journal, but uh, it's freely available. We post these papers online and there's you can study these papers by looking at them online but you can also download them as PDF files and get your own personal copy printed out, hand it around to other people. You can attach the PDF file to an email to send it to anyone around the world, 24-7, 365, free of charge. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? You don't have to pay for this information, okay? And so back in 2021, June 23, we published the Topeak Sandstone paper. Here's what it looks like. On the left is the PDF cover, first page of that Answers Research Journal paper. On the right is the appendix because I had appendices with more detailed information, photographs of all these, all these samples and detailed descriptions. So I had to go to the nth degree. As I said before, these papers are very long because I couldn't just show you one photograph from one sample and say this feature was found in every sample. I had to show a, a, a photograph of that feature in every sample for every feature. And so you've got all that information at your fingertips. And then uh, there was the paper on the Bright Angel uh, formation. It was published on September 8, 2021 in the Answers Research Journal. And uh, the Muar formation, it was published on August 10, 2022 in the Answers Research Journal. Um, here's the paper again. There's the Bright Angel over 100 pages long on the left, and there's the appendix on the right. The appendices are the same with the MUAV. Um, these are huge papers, folks, but it has all the technical details. So you see, for example, when Ken Ham can get up and say in 30 seconds or 60 seconds about these bent layers in the Grand Canyon, if anyone challenges him, he knows that there's these technical papers that he can point people to, you see. Okay, that's why it's very important that we have the 
detailed documentation with all the references, all the procedures, like any scientific papers. And then, of course, they've got the papers that I said, I've said on papers on each of the folds that build on the original three papers on the different layers, okay? And so the paper on the Carbon Canyon fold was published on February 22nd last year, 2023. Here it is here. On the left is the paper. On the right, it's over 120 pages long. On the right is the appendix uh, describing all the samples, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, on August 9th last year, we published the paper on the, uh, the, the monument fold, okay, in the ANSYS Research Journal. And right now, even as I speak, uh, the Bright Angel Formation, sorry, the Whitmore Helipad Fold paper is going to go up on the ANSYS Research Journal page next week. Okay, it's been, it's been publishing, uh, published, it's ready. And this is what the Monument Fold paper looks like. So you can see, you know, you can download the PDF, you can download the appendix, you can have all this information for yourself. Okay, and the last paper on the um, on the Matt Catamoeba fold. Okay, the that was the Whitmore helipad fold that's being published next week. The paper on the Matt Catamoeba fold has been written. Um, even as I speak now, I'm looking at the last of the scan electron microscope images to finish the last bit of the paper. It'll then go out for review, peer review, and then it'll be finalised and then it'll be published. So it'll be all done and dusted before 2024 is out. Well, in the meantime, okay, apart from this video presentation that you're seeing now, uh, our friends at Answers.tv, because Answers in Genesis is a multiplicity of ministries, we've also got our own streaming platform, Answers.tv, and uh, uh, the team there, is in the process because, you know, we've taken cameraman through the Grand Canyon. I take people through the Grand Canyon, but not everyone is physically able or has the money to go on through a, a trip through the Grand Canyon. So we're going to produce a, an Answers.TV series of a trip through the Grand Canyon. So a virtual trip through the Grand Canyon with all the stops at all the teaching points. And there'll also be interviews about this research and all the laboratory research and uh, work and all the results. So if you haven't subscribed to Answers.TV, you better do so because there's so much there. There's kids programs, there's Answers University programs, there's adult programs, there's wildlife programs, there's homeschool programs. Uh, you know, Answers.TV is another place that you can go to. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I need to acknowledge uh, everyone that was involved in this research. Yes, I need to acknowledge the Grand Canyon National Park that issued the permit and also issued the permit for not only collecting the samples, but also for the raft trip through the canyon. Okay. Uh, the donors that made this research possible, you know, the very fact that we can sit here and do this work is because of the faithful giving of so many donors. And there were donors who gave for th to this research. Of course, the AIG leadership encouraged and supported this research, so they need to be thanked. The Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, lawyers who fought the lawsuit so that we could get the permits to do this research. And of course, Tom Vale of Canyon Ministries, who outfitted and led the research trip. And then uh, Dr. John Whitmore, Senior Professor of Geology, who came on the trip with me and helped with the collecting of the samples. And then Ray Strom, you saw him in the photograph You'll see him in the photograph of the scanning electron microscope. His lab up in Calgary, Alberta, did the painstaking laboratory laboratory work and you know advised me with the professional insights that he had. And then, of course, the reviewers who have looked at these papers to preview to review them, Dr. John Whitmore and at uh, Cedarville University and Dr. Tim Clary, ICR. I'm very grateful for my colleagues who've checked on my work. So thank you very much. I'm Dr. Andrew Snelling, and I trust you've enjoyed this trip through the Grand Canyon, looking at real research done by creation geologists, uh, flood geologists. Uh, you know, we go out, we get the samples, we do the lab work, we're real scientists. And here we have, we've looked at a, a real world question, uh, posed a 
scientific question about the rocks in the Grand Canyon. We've gone out and got the samples. We've looked at the evidence and we've come to a conclusion that biblical glasses, a biblical worldview is the only way to understand this evidence. It fits. It fits what the Bible says about the global cataclysmic flood back at the, in the days of Noah, only 4,350 years ago or thereabouts, that only lasted one year rather than the hundreds of millions of years that the conventional wisdom says the Grand Canyon. So after all, the Grand Canyon is still exhibit, e, exhibit A for the biblical worldview of, of creation and the flood. Thank you and God bless.